Hello, this is Michael Gross, and I'm here with Game Changer with Vicki Avelson. Nice to see you, and uh, hope you enjoy this show. You're still on your own. Okay. By the way, I'm here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. If any of you uh, have ever been here, it's a gorgeous place, and uh, I welcome you all to the uh, to Mountain Time. Oh, Michael, I can't believe I did this to you. You're such a good sport. I was having such a good time on vacation, and there you are. I'm bugging I'm, me. I'm wrecking the whole thing showing up like this. You're very persuasive. Let's just oh. put it that way. So, okay, so tell us where you are and why you're there. I am in an upstairs room in my home in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I think I just realized what you can see on the back wall. It betrays my Midwestern heritage. I think there's a, a rug beater and a, oh. and a washboard on the back wall here. Okay. The washboard, so the washboard used to belong in my grandmother's neighbor, Irma, Irma Niemeyer, when she left her 17 room Victorian home in, um, in Iowa to move to Chicago, I, she said, what do you want? And I said, I'll take that washboard. Really? Yeah, there you go. I have a couple of things of my grandmother's. I have a big bell that she used to ring when it was mealtime. Yes, yes. Was she a country person? Well, she had a house in Wartsboro, New York. That was a country house. Yes. Oh, wow. Sure. You uh, had to gather people in from the field. <laughs> no, seriously, with, with yes. the, that's why you rang the uh, the dinner bell, sure. That, that's right. That's why they rang the dinner bell. And so right now, the reason that I'm distracted is because I'm letting people know that we're live because uh, otherwise that, that won't happen. So, Michael, what are you guys doing in New Mexico? How long have you been in New Mexico? Uh, I have been in, well, we've owned a home here for over 30, 30 years. Oh, wow. And uh, yeah, and uh, uh we uh, we come and go when work is slow or vacation times and things like that. We've done that for over 30 years. Uh, we actually spent a lot of er the early COVID lockdown here, figuring it was safer than a large uh, urban area like uh, Southern California. We had no intention of staying here. We actually came out here to do a little something in March of 2020, and we no sooner got out here then LA said, we're shutting down. And so my wife and I looked at each other and said, maybe we should just stay here. Uh, they had a very aggressive, uh, New Mexico has a very aggressive uh, a governor in terms of uh, healthcare. And she used to be their health commissioner for the state. Uh -huh. and so she was very strong about the lockdown. Cases were very low among the Western states. It was actually doing quite well. Um, so we thought, I think it feels safer here. Uh, so we, we stayed for a, a great deal of, uh, of the lockdown, but we've been coming and going ever since. I've been back in L.A. since, and uh, we're just out here to do a little bit of construction on the house. And as any, everybody knows out there, you have to keep an eye on the contractors. So that's <laughs> why we're here. Okay. Yeah, you don't have to keep. Oh, I love that washboard. Wait, what's the thing above the washboard? Uh, it's a rug beater. A rug beater. Yeah, you know, so you wash. Put, well, uh, to, to literally beat the rug, you would put the rug out on your clothesline and then you'd hit it with that thing and <laughs> knock all the dust out of it. So you didn't have to wash the rug. They're right. No, you you didn't, just... no exact, well, I suppose you could if you had to, but obviously these were devised in the days before vacuum cleaners uh, and before there was electricity out in the, uh, out in the, out in the rural America. So you'd uh, beat the hell out of this rug and hang it over your clothesline. Yeah. So, so we'll get back to COVID in a minute. So where are your people from, Michael? Well, uh, to be honest with you, uh, the, the Midwestern uh, people, uh, I, my people from Ch well, Chicago, and then the rural folk were from Iowa, Nebraska, Kansas. And, so are uh, you multi-generation American? Oh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. My, uh, my uh, great, uh, great grandparents owned, uh, they were German. That was the German side of me. The, the Irish and the Germans. I'm Irish and German on both sides, actually. And some were sod busters and railroaders in uh, in the rural uh, Midwest, in the Great Plains. And um, and then there were the uh, the the German. Well, the German and the Irish uh, both worked in uh, in uh, in Chicago. And uh, my great grandfather was a tavern owner in uh, in Chicago. 
So he was slinging beer. Yeah. And so, uh, so it was, um, you know, I have, I, I was fortunate enough to spend, uh, uh, school years in Chicago and, uh, and, um, many summers in rural America. And, uh, so it was a great, it was a great childhood. How did I get so screwed up? I have no idea. <laughs> and you were in parochial school on top of it, weren't you? Yes, I was, I was, I actually, uh, you know, it's, I, I tend to be left of center in terms of politics. And people will say, say to me, um, how did that well, happen, Michael? Well, no, it has <laughs> nothing to do with Hollywood. You know, occasionally get that. Oh, Hollywood liberal. I say bullshit. Mm. No, not at all. Uh, I come from a mother who was raised Irish Catholic mother mm -hmm. who was as Catholic and as 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 Irish on the day is as a day is long. But she never refused to help another human being. She didn't care who they were. Every, oh. I, I swear to God, I was 10 years old in working class Chicago and there were Muslims at our table because she worked at a, she worked at a big city hospital. There uh -huh. were a lot of international doctors. It was like Dr. Dr. Nassan, Hassan Najafi has no place <laughs> to go. He would have to go all the way back to Iran for Christmas. And so they, everybody was welcome at our house uh, from all over the world. And so wow. uh, I was ten, I was eight and 10 years old and I had uh, Muslims from Persia, as they call Iran in those days. Yes, they at, did. At, uh, at the uh, at the Christmas and the Thanksgiving tables and people people who were who had nowhere to go. So that was my mom. Right. And uh, trying to teach trying to teach them how to do the sign of the cross. Right. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> And then my father was a convert to Catholicism, which you had to be, because uh, uh, he was a Methodist and he refused to let me, I went to Catholic grammar school. He refused, this is one of the, my lovely stories about my father. Okay. He refused to let me go to Catholic high school. I was so pissed off. All my because? All my friends were going to uh, Weber and St. Patrick's and St. Ignatius and all this. Why uh -huh. not? My father finally sat down. He said, there's a lot of people in this world I've been to eight years of Catholic grammar school. Right. So there are a lot of people in this world who don't believe the things you do. And I think it's time you get to know a few of them. Okay. I love you. So my I was 14. I was 14 and my father wow. from a small town in Iowa. And my, one of my regrets of these days is I never asked him, where did you start thinking like that? You came from a provincial tiny town in Iowa. Where did you start thinking that way that I had to associate with, 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 with Jews and people of color and, and Protestants and so forth and so on? He said, I never asked him that question. I wish I had because he's gone now, but it was one of the greatest gifts he ever gave me. So I'm not a, I'm not a Hollywood liberal. I'm a small town, Iowa liberal and a, and a creation of working class Chicago liberal. What do you think your, your parents would have thought of the last four years prior to this one now? I think it, I think it would have been tough for them because mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, like, look, my, 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 I come from a good capitalist family. We believed in that American dream. You make your right. money, do, as, do uh -huh. as well as you can, get uh -huh. ahead, send your kids to better, make a better life for your kids for your school. The, so uh, they were never avaricious, right. but they were not, there was a mean streak about the last the, the four years of the Trump administration. Mm -hmm. and people would say somebody said to me recently, what would Alex P. Keaton be doing right now from Family Ties if he were a Trump, if you're a Trump follower? What would you how would you feel as his parent? And I said, mm -hmm. first of all, the premise of that is whole all, completely wrong. He was um, he, he was a moneymaker. He had mm -hmm. a kind of avarice. Mm -hmm. He was um, uh, he was uh, he, he wanted he wanted to make a fortune. But right. he, wasn't, he wasn't angry and mean. Right. He was a good hearted person who wanted to make a pile of money, right. he a, but he had a good heart. And I think that was the difference. I don't think he would have been a follower of Trump because there was a, a kind of meanness about, uh, about Mr. Trump that I never, I never liked. Um, and, uh, this is and, fascinating. I, and, I, and I'm a dyed in the wool capitalist myself. Mm -hmm. I got, to, I have no problem with it. Uh, this is fascinating to to project what a fictionalized character how they would respond to, to the exactly. last four years. I really kind of like this. Okay, so let's get back to your family, and then we'll get back to COVID. So, so your people are are Middle America, uh, as as rural America, Chicago. But you, Chicago, were you, were you in were you in the city of Chicago? Or we were, were in the city of Chicago. My fa uh, I was in a very uh, lower middle class background. I mean, there mm -hmm. was a 
uh, uh, there were two factories across the street from my house and uh, right, yeah, directly across the street from my house was a, uh, a park. Thank God, a oh. vest park at, pocket park, a small mm -hmm. Chicago park. On one side of it was a factory and on the other side was a commercial bakery. And behind that were the railroad tracks that fed both the factories and the bake and the commercial bakery. Wow. So it was very, very working class. Mm -hmm. Um, were but, you on the right side of the tracks or the wrong side of the track? I don't know what that means. No, in those, in those days, I have to tell you this. Uh, I in those days in Chicago, when everybody had a job, I was in the right side of the tracks. Right. I was I was definitely part of the hoi polloi. That mm -hmm. is to say, the common man. Mm -hmm. I was uh, we were we did not have a fancy life, but every man in that in that neighborhood had a decent job. Mm -hmm. Parent mothers could stay at home. You didn't have two parents' households because we mm -hmm. were making enough money. Right. So you took care of the house. You took care of the lawn. You were. I was. It was a neighbor. It was a neighborhood of immigrants and and sons and daughters of immigrants. Um, uh, a little bit of everything. And in, in my in my in my neighborhood, an exotic person was essentially an Italian. That was like, <laughs> whoa, whoa, you know. I mean, there were a few Jews, but I didn't know them. Until I had nothing to do with them until I went to my father made me go to public school took me out of my Roman Catholic bubble. So did you not know what a bagel was until you were, you know, I, I, I didn't know what a bagel was until I was in one way in my 20s, seriously. And um, no, I knew Wonder Bread. That was my life. That was my life. Uh, I um, no, and I go to tell you, uh, when I went to high school, I was invited. I knew nothing. Um, there was a, <laughs> I, I, was, I knew nothing. I was such a protected little kid in my, I wanted, I was an altar boy. I was, you oh, know, wow. yeah, I was, I was really a very strongly religious kid back in those days. And when, when I was invited. Hey, Michael, to, excuse me for one second. Were you a religious kid with belief? Yes. Oh, yes. With okay. Belief. Okay. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Hook, line, and sinker. Uh, mm -hmm. I think one of the reasons my father, uh, uh, my father actually wanted to send me to high school because uh, public high school, because at age fourteen I was already making noises about, you know, I think I really want to be a priest. My father was like, I think he was, he never <laughs> said, he was horrified, you know. Yeah. And at any rate, uh, uh, so um, long story short, I went to, I was invited to a party at uh, a, a Jewish girl's house. And she sent me a note. She sent me a note. It'll be Friday at such and such a time. And here's the address. She passed a note to me in chorus class. And uh, and Susan said, oh, by at the bottom, it said B-Y-O-B. B-Y-O-B. I didn't know what that meant. And I thought it was something Jewish because I had heard of the, I had heard of the uh, B'nai Brith. Bring your own bagel. No, I thought it was, I thought it was, the, something to do with the B'nai B'rith Youth Organization because yeah, yeah. there were two B's and a Y and an O. <laughs> and it was like, what is this Jewish thing at the end? So, I mean, that, I lead, led a very protective life. And uh, anyway, she was one of the two Ducart twins, uh, Susan and Shelley Ducart, who were my first Jewish friends in my public school. I would have never thought Ducart would be a Jewish name. That's an interesting thing right there no, all by well, itself. It may have had it, may, may have had it changed. So, so Michael, you, you're coming up in this upbringing, you're, you're religious, you're thinking of maybe the clergy, you're in this environment, you're going to, to parochial school, you go to public school. How did, how did you get bit by the bug? How, how, at what point did you decide, oh, I want to go to Hollywood? <laughs> <laughs> I never decided I want to go to Hollywood. No, you were an actor for, you were a New no, York. But, no, but that was, I mean, that was, acting wasn't even on. This was not something, we didn't have a lot of money. We didn't go to plays. We went to movies, and we never. Yeah. Went to, we never. a family. We never went to movies on time. <laughs> you know, it's true. We would. We were the people who came in because they ran continuously in those days. You didn't need right. to. Separate. You paid once, and if you wanted to see the movie three times, you sat there for three times. We <laughs> always came in the middle of a movie, and saw the end of it, and then saw the cartoons and the newsreel, and they'd start it again and say, "Okay, we leave. This is where we came in," and. We never, I never saw a movie from the beginning as a child. You know, Michael, I haven't had that chaos. thought. I haven't chaos. had that thought in 50 years. And you know, we did that too. We, it, I can remember saying, okay, this is where we came in. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We never, we never knew what times movies started. You just knew there was a movie playing. So you went. 
<laughs> oh God, you! I remember that. So okay, so did the first time you went? Like, where did it have? Where did the? Well, I'll tell you. It all started with music, which is still one of my favorite things. Uh, okay. My mother, uh, my grandfather, who was a Chicago firefighter, uh-huh. actually, because wow. that was as Irish as the day is long. Oh, so right. On her <laughs> side, you had to be a cop or a fire firefighter. He was a Chicago right. fireman, uh, and uh, he played the cello. Okay, wow. when he was mostly when he was a kid, right? Wow. And uh, so my mother was always musical. She always sang in choirs and things like that. She was always dragging me into some choir. Come on, they need an extra male voice for the Sunday service. Come on, to the local Catholic school, you know. Uh-huh. She was always in choirs. Yeah. And um, uh, so it was natural for me to get it into the choir at uh, at um, at uh, public school, public high school. So I got into the choir and uh, loved it. I just loved singing. I told mm-hmm. you it was in the choral class, the music class, where Susan Ducart passed me that note. <laughs> and uh, yeah, right. Meet the most interesting people. You know, the Bohemians, right? <laughs> you know, BYOB, wow. A whole new world opening up, right? <laughs> Bring what? I don't know. Bagels, as you said, right? So, uh, you know, so uh, it started with music. And one day, and I think my senior year, we did a lot of choral music. We had an incredible choral director who was just so dedicated and made us believe this is not, you're not here for play. This music is work and music is values. And, you know, he introduced me to, you know, classical music and things, you know, just all sorts of wonderful things. Right. The music appreciation classes, but then there was a chorus and we went, we won, um, we won, uh, Chicago uh, high school championships from our little high school. We wow. would go to downtown Chicago, sang at Orchestra Hall, where the Chicago, home of the Chicago Symphony and stuff like this. He was an incredible choral director. And in my senior year of high school, he walked into class one day and said, guys, there's a local girls Catholic high school that's doing a production of Rogers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma. There are no boys that come to this school. They need, they're like the Marines. They're looking for a few good men. <laughs> well, you know, the, the guys are Girls. The, like an entire school full of frustrated Catholic women. So went over there that afternoon, auditioned for Oklahoma. You're making me cry. Got a part in Oklahoma. And, um, and in a funny way, that was the beginning. I, uh, it, it, that resonated a year later. That was my senior year of high school. I, went into college, a, a local, like a commuter campus. It was a four-year school at University of Illinois, Chicago. We couldn't afford going away. I couldn't afford right. going board. We went to, I went to school on the bus or the, and the subway every day. That was how I got to school. There was subway there? In Chicago? Yeah. I didn't even know Ch- that. Wow. Elevated and subways. Yeah, come on. I- Big city, Chicago. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, no, we had, we had subways. Taxi. And- yeah, right, 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 exactly. So New York, taxi. And no, in New York, I ride the subways. But yeah, yeah, and we so we had we had that in Chicago. So I, that's how I got to school every day. So one day in my freshman year in college, I was in um, I was in pre med. Actually, it was the way I was thinking because my father or my mother, as I said, worked at a hospital. She knew all these doctors. There was a lot of medical influence in the family, and I thought that sounds great. These healers, I like the idea of that, and. Uh, did you have a specialty in mind when you? No, entered? I did. No, I did not. I just wanted the white coat I, <laughs> and the steth- the stethoscope sticking out of the pocket. You know, it's like, oh, doctor, right? You know, full wardrobe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the wardrobe. <laughs> I was in it for the costume. <laughs> At any rate, so uh, you know, walk around. Oh, he's a healer. He has hands, <laughs> hands. You know, I love that idea. You know, like lay hands on people, make them better. I really did. You know, that sort of went in with the whole Christ blessing the sick and all that. I was going to say, did you believe, did you believe that's, did you believe that you could, that people could heal through their hands? I did not. I did not. But but I, but that appealed to me from my background. It's like, you know, Mm -hmm. you went, you laid hands on people. That's part of the healing. You touched them, you know, didn't make them feel like lepers. You touched them. Somebody once said, why did Christ walk across the room and cure the leper and touch him? He says it was he could have cured him from across the room. Somebody said it was to give the man dignity. Oh. He touched he touched a dirty thing. What everybody said was dirty. 
He gave the man his dignity as well as hating it. That's why he had he walked to the man and didn't say from across the room, you're healed. Go, you know, go take it easy. You're healed. So anyway, that appealed to me. So I met a woman in my first year of, uh, of college who said, hey, I was in that production with you at uh, of Oklahoma. <laughs> we're, we're doing a production of, um, of uh, Ro- Roger, uh, I don't know, um, Arthur Miller's The Crucible. Uh, uh, you know, the witches, Salem and all that sort of thing. And I thought, oh, wow, that sounds fascinating. She said, you ought to audition. I went, ah, I'm not, I don't do that. Curiosity got the better of me. I sat in in that audition of, uh, of Crucible for a day or two, watched people, didn't get up and read, but like any uh, just person full of himself, I'm watching these people <laughs> read and I'm, and I'm thinking to myself, Shit, I could do that better. I could read better than that person. You know, that that's terrible. That person's terrible. I could do a better job than that. And I'm not even an actor, you know? <laughs> no, a real dilettantism. Wait, before well, you get to the crucible, what was your role in Oklahoma? How far did, what, what was your, do you remember I your- I was role? a character named, I was the comic uh, male, uh, uh, Will Parker. There was, uh, there was Le- uh, Curly and uh, right. Laurie, you know, and then there was yes. Will Parker and Adu Annie, who were the comic, characters yes. so i got you know so i was uh yeah i was the i was the second male lead if you will the com the comic guy you know i got to kansas city <laughs> on a friday by saturday i learned a thing or two you know <laughs> all that stuff i was hoping you'd give us a, a little yeah, a little, okay, a little yeah. oklahoma. <laughs> a little oklahoma and um so uh this woman in in, uh, in college said okay uh you were good in that come over and i come over and audition for the crucible and i went eh, i don't do that it's not that's not realistic i'm you know come on nobody does that for a living you just and i sat there and i thought i i watched those people audition these guys and i went shit i'm better than that and i'm not even an actor you know i just i went i i don't buy what they're doing i don't buy it you know so a discerning so, critic in a couple that yes always the critic right <laughs> mostly self-critical which is the sad part about it but got up in a couple in a couple days later got a script in my hand and said yeah i want to read for something so i read for a couple things and read for a couple roles here and there and the auditions lasted a couple days i went back and lo and behold i got a pretty decent role in the crucible what was your role in the crucible he was a man it was i think one of the most fascinating roles in the piece a man my name a reverend hale and reverend hale was a a witch hunter Mm -hmm. who came in to rid the place of witches and decided halfway through the play that this was all bullshit that this would there were there were private private concerns and private anger going on here and people getting and this was not about witches at all this was about enmity between neighbors and he began to say you know this this process is not working so he's a man who had his doubts a man in who began to have his own self-conflict wow but it's a wonderful role Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, Reverend uh, Hale was his name. Long story short, the man who directed that play became one of my best friends, oh. uh, my mentor, an acting teacher, uh, the best man at my wedding. Oh, come on. You just and gave me goose. But- lifelong oh. friends. Oh, and it doesn't end there. He passed away last year. Oh, I'm sorry. This this August 20th on his birthday next month, I'm going to his unveiling in Chicago at his graveside. Oh, Michael. I will be back in Chicago with my dear friend, William, who was my, uh, who, who, who was my uh, uh, sculptor in many ways. He said, he said, look, if you ever, if you ever think you're serious about this, I think I could help you. I think you have some talent. I think you should try this. And he became one of my best friends. And as I said, 35 years ago, the best man at my wedding, a, a lifelong, wow. an wow. incredible, incredible man, as the Jews would say, a mensch. mensch. He was a full human being, generous to a fault, an incredible human being who died in his 80s, still uh, working in theater. Wow. And did he, obviously, he started you in your craft. Did he? Did you he get- was the first. He was the first person who taught me this was this was serious. But well, he was not the first person, but he was one of the first people who taught me this was serious business. 
was you it's not here to get laid and believe me i thought it was <laughs> and, and did my best you know people say um you know why did you go into the arts and i'm you know i mean my my flip answer is the actresses you know are you kidding me uh you know this there were there were uh, oh i went in i went into the world of art because there were a lot of incredible women who were surrounded by effeminate men in many cases and it's like <laughs> Why would I join the football team and be in a locker room full of men? I didn't give a shit. I wanted to be where the women were, and that was the arts. Wow. Well, it's a good enough reason to get there. Did did he did he impart anything to you, Michael, that you can this is putting you really on the spot, but I'm just curious. Is there anything that he gave you, any nugget that he gave you then that you took with you that you can and that's being very unfair. Nikki, no, I'm, I'm, no, it's not unfair. I'm just, I'm a bit at a loss because there was so, so much over time. What he mm, did was, sure. what he did over time in the aggregate was open huge worlds to me. Mm. Uh, worlds I didn't know existed. He was, even in this, at the University of Illinois, in a, you know, commuter campus, um, he said, I'm training the entire actor. You have to, we, they had no dance or anything like that at school. So right. I want my actors to take dance classes outside of school. We're doing modern dance. We're taking ballet. We're doing wow. this. We're doing that. We're going off campus to do extracurricular things because your body is your instrument. I'm training you for classical theater. He was, by the way, an alum, though a Chicago boy originally, he was an alumnus of the Pasadena Playhouse out in Southern California. Oh, wow. In wow. the great days, his classmates were people like Ruth Buzzy. Um, uh, uh, he worked with uh, 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 Dustin Hoffman. Wow, who was also, who was also there at the uh, at the Pasadena Playhouse in those days. Although he never became an actor himself, he became a director and direct and directed his life towards training young actors. And he was he was extraordinary. Take no prisoners. Uh, tough guy when it came to that. He, uh, I remember one of my, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, he was not easy. He was not easy. I remember one of these, uh, this Reverend Hale in the crucible at one of mm -hmm. our, uh, one of our, uh, performances, I was like weeping copiously. I was trying to persuade John Proctor not to, to just say, to say he had been a witch and that would save his life, spare his life, because life is the most important gift and all of this was bullshit. It's not worth the death and all this sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And I'm I'm crying, you know, as I'm saying this and they're like people are in the front and I'm going, wow, I'm I'm pretty incredible. <laughs> I am. I'm crying real tears. And wow. people in the front row were like, oh. <sighs> and and it was like, bravo, Michael, at the end, bravo. All wow. This and the, and uh, here's my dog who just jumped on my lap. I, I was gonna say, this is, back. Elsa's this is back. Juju, How? Juju, How who's just you? come back oh, from a Juju. wellness. And are you well? Are you well? Oh, well, that answers you? your question. Oh, what that answers sweetie. your question. So anyway, um, so I came off stage and I had done this, what I thought was a brilliant performance and uh -huh. people were sitting with, bravo, Michael, oh my God. And, and I'm standing there looking at, 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 at Bill, it's like, what do you think? What do you think here? And he said, that was the most self indulgent piece of shit I ever saw in my life. And I'm like, oh, I was and here. Wow. I'm thinking I was brilliant. He said, you lost the character. You lost the character. That was Michael gross weeping about this. That was not the character. Wow. And I went, oh, there's a difference. He said, well, your character has a point there. Your character was there to do something and you completely just washed it out with your own emotion. He says that was self indulgent bullshit. And I went, okay, he wasn't, he was, well, that's a takeaway was, right there. Yeah, right. So, yes. That's a takeaway. My first performance. I'm sitting there saying, I got bravos tonight. <laughs> he said that was shit. Wow. He says, wow, some, wow, wow. you can fool some people with that, but you can't fool me. Wow. <laughs> So That's, I mean, you know, I, was, I love it. You know, he, he gave me so many gifts. Did you know from that role? Okay, this is what I want to do. Did you decide then? No, I, no? I didn't. I was an English mm -hmm. major for a while. I was an anthropology major for a while, but the, the pull was there. The pull had definitely been established. And uh, uh, I, I, I loved the work. I loved 
the uh, the fact that people were your palate, you know, where you were working with the human condition. And of course, I love the girls. As I <laughs> That's so, a running theme. I get that. I know. Yeah, something about actresses as opposed to female anthropologists, it just wasn't doing it for me. You know, <laughs> hands in their dirt, you know, the actresses were all, hmm. Anyway, so no, it was a, bu a whole bunch of things, but it finally, I finally said, okay, I think this is, this is really stupid and it's not at all what, um, what, what lower middle class practical working class kids do. It's there's something absolutely foolish. It's like going off and joining the circus. But I, <laughs> if I don't do it, I suppose I won't forgive myself. So try it. I mean, I don't own a house. I don't own a car. I don't, you know what? I'll take a chance. And how did how did your did your parents I, support you in your decision? That's a good question because there are a lot of people who who think you're absolutely nuts. My parents did not. My father did not. My father endured it thinking i think my mother was excited because she was always the ham in the family right she was the only the only ham that could never be cured right <laughs> she, she was she was the one who would get up in the in the family parties and put on the silly hat and go into another room and smear her face with lips and come out and play a character play characters come Fantastic. out with, she'd raid somebody's closets and come on with the, the craziest pieces of clothes on and a feather boa and do and i would be Fabulous. sitting in the neighborhood sitting in the in 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 the corner embarrassed as all hell <laughs> why can't my mother be normal little did i know at that time that she was teaching me mm. a kind of fearlessness mm. get out there and so the hell what who cares mm. dance as if no one's watching that old yeah. thing you know yeah and uh she didn't give a shit she just she wow. wanted yeah got up there and she was she was far, braver than I've ever been on a stage, I, I have to say. Wow. Because she could get up and do the, in the middle of impromptu, impromptu, just get up and do complete nonsense. No rehearsal, no, just she just had it in her. <laughs> and I had a sister, Mary Gross, who we learned that even better than I and went to Second City and four years of Saturday Night Live, a brilliant comedian who was far, I think, braver than I to this day because she was doing improvisation. She was talk about letting it all hang out. No, I need rehearsal. <laughs> you know, I mean, I could I could do that if I have to, and I have I've done it at times. But but Mary, she could let it fly like my mother. How amazing that your parents could spawn two of you. Two, two, it's shocking, and and quite an age difference between the two of you. Yes, not too much. Six years. Six. Actually. Okay, that's yeah. Not, so yeah. so you were already doing was mary doing it early like were you doing no, it at the she, same time? Uh, she discovered uh, she started she she was at loyola university by mm -hmm. s seeing how badly i had gone my parents sent her to catholic <laughs> schools she was at Loyola. well the girls are going to catholic we're going to protect their virginity as long as we can mm -hmm. and uh so uh she was at loyola <laughs> university in chicago and uh, i think took a Oh, took an improv class just because mm. it was a sh silly elective to do mm. found out she was she had a she had a real uh she had a real thing for it a gift and somebody in the class said you know i or saw her and said you know i run this thing we we, we go to john barleycorn's uh bar uh on in Ch north side of chicago and we pass the hat and we do improv and mm. Lo and behold, one thing led to another. She found herself in Second City. It was John Belushi who helped get her the job wow. at, at SNL. Wow. Uh, who had known Belushi was, of course, a Chicagoan. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so, and that's a you know, relatively small town. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, but of course, in that, it, particularly in the comics, uh, you know, improv and all that sort of thing, and theater. And so Mary found herself on 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 SNL. And uh, anyway, so but you were or you were already a working actor. I had been. Yeah, I had uh, I went a very traditional way. I went to I was interested in classical theater and Shakespeare and so forth and so on, you know, and so went at, left the University of Illinois, graduated from there and went to the School of Drama at Yale University. OK, again, oh, had a very. Yeah. What? I know this about you, but t that's that's quite quite an accomplishment. 
Um, well, I know, I know like a lot of very angry actors who are very successful who couldn't get into Yale. So how did that happen for you? <laughs> you know, I think Bill, Bill, my friend Bill was instrumental in helping me with that too. He helped prepare me for the auditions. I felt confident. I went in and, and did it. And I, I took some imaginative leaps in my, um, in my audition, some very- Do you remember what you-, what you Well, exactly. Audition? I mean, you, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of classical people had, uh, uh, a, lot of, a lot of classical people, young actors are encouraged to do two auditions, one right. comic and one right. serious, right. one classical and one modern, whatever right. that is, right? So a more modern piece uh, and two contrasting pieces. Right. So when I did my, uh, my, my audition for Yale, I believe I did uh, a very, a very silly, wonderful little, little play uh, called uh, an excerpt from a play called Love, L-U-V by a man oh, yes. named Murray Shishkal. Mm -hmm. And it's a little comic piece about a man sitting in a park and a dog takes a piss on his gabardine pants. <laughs> and it's a story he tells about this odd little dog that comes up to him, looks like a little old man with a little wrinkled face and a beard and all. And this dog just raises his leg and is like, why me? Why all over my gabardine pants? Why I, of all the people in the world, why does this dog stop and take a piss on me? You know, and it's like, it's this great little wonderful piece. And the other piece I did was the classic piece, but because I had been trained a lot in movement and things like that, mm -hmm. I decided to do, instead of a Shakespeare piece, I did a classic sort of Greek messenger speech when somebody comes in and announces the death of someone else. And I did it almost as a dance. It was a <gasps> sort of a, a um, because it was high on movement. You're coming in, falling on the floor and then reliving the whole, reliving, wow. reliving you know, the, the Greeks never had in classical Greek literature, never had any deaths on stage. It always happened. Oedipus I didn't know put, that. Oedipus put out his eyes on stage and then came out. Uh, people were killed off stage, and a Greek messenger would come in and describe the horrible thing that had just happened, how somebody had, wow. people had tore someone apart and disemboweled someone, and they tell the whole story. You never saw the blood and gore on stage wow. in, Greek, in Greek, classical Greek. It was always described. And so I did it almost with a lot of movement, almost like it was a sort of dance uh, voice thing huge wow and so i said i want to show them i can move i want to show them I'm, i can i'm a physical actor as well and and display my voice and the but you know but you know present it uh hu hugely so right. it, the one piece was a guy a schlub who's sitting in a park bench talking about you know dog who pisses on him and this <laughs> other one is this huge <laughs> classical thing so two very big contrasting pieces and that's how i got into that's one of the things that i think helped get me into yale how wonderful and so at that point does your father now support what you're yes he very much supported it i mean you you, you know you wave my my father knew that my father was from small town iowa but he knew he always knew the the value of an education mm -hmm. and he he himself had he was a college graduate. He was a graduate in journalism, actually, at the Univers University of Iowa in Iowa City. Wow. And uh, and then came to Chicago to get a newspaper newspaper job. He wanted to work for a great metropolitan newspaper. And the Second World War happened. That was the end mm -hmm. of that, right? Uh, and came out doing something completely different. But uh, he always valued education and always wanted his kids to go to college. And of course, when you... Uh, I remember at the end, at the end of my college, at the, my college graduation, I had two things on the table. I had been asked to do, there was a bus and truck company of actors called the National Shakespeare Company. And I had been offered s several roles in the National Shakespeare Company to go all over the United States and actually make money. I mean, it was something <laughs> like $200 a week, but it was room and board. And, right. and I said, dad, I have an offer from Yale and I have an offer for real money. And he all, you know, all these years, you know, he came from a family that didn't have a lot of money and valued a dollar. Right. I said, I can make 200 bucks a week. I've never made $200 a week in my life. 
or I could go to Yale and probably go into debt and have to take college loans and all that stuff. He said, you're going to Yale. Wow. We're going to make this happen. Wow. Um, and he was a guy who, when I went to my first summer stock job, I was making $15 a week in room and board. He was like, oh my Jesus, <laughs> what is this boy going to amount to? But he should have known because I was making $15 a week in room and board. By the end of that summer, I came home with money in my pocket. I was a very, I was a very practical guy. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I knew that was that, that Midwest working class, not, nah, you know, a penny served, a penny saved is a penny earned, all that mm -hmm. stuff. It's like, you know, I could come home with 15 bucks in my pocket because I had room and board and beer was only a dollar a pitcher in those days. <laughs> well, you're still using a rug beater and a washboard. So there Michael, I'd say he did a good job. There you go. There you go. Yes, yes. Uh, so, okay. So, so you do Yale and, and, and do you have a side job? How are you supporting yourself through Yale? Do you, well, do I, was, give you I uh, well, I, this is one of the things I feel very sorry for, I'm uh, very sorry for kids these days because kids don't have the kids have it so hard these days. Mm -hmm. First of all, although my father never made probably more than $10,000 a year in his life, mm -hmm. uh, Yale was, was, well, I mean, it, Yale was approximately $4,000 a year. Now that was everything. That was uh, in those days. Right. There was room and board and tuition was $4,000 a year. Now to somebody who's making $10,000 a year, that's a big bite. Yes. I sold some of my, I was, I, th I thought I'd never be home again. I sold some of my furniture and my, my bedroom furniture to go to <laughs> Yale the first year. Wow. I sold a bed that I just really loved. It was this great mm. oak thing that I don't know, felt kind of Victorian and anyway. I sold it to, to a friend for a hundred bucks. I just needed everything I could get. So I, I got some scholarship money, some grant money and took out loans. But here's where kids don't have, kids have it so hard today. I got 3% government loans, 3%. Mm -hmm. Now those were the days where you could open a savings account, what they call a passbook account and get five or 6%. Right. So I could afford right. a percent loan because right. I could let my money sit in the bank You'd open a, an account, they give you 5% and they say, oh, and wow. take a toaster too. <laughs> or, Here's a set of cookware for opening an account. I, f I got my first set of luggage. Op I'm going multiple times to open accounts at banks so I could get a match set of luggage. <laughs> Seriously. And you'd get 6%. So I was able to pay back mm. all of my government loans wow. because they were th only 3%. And I could I could put money in the bank and make five and six percent. Wow! In a savings account. Wow! So I was coming I was coming out ahead of every year by two percent. Wow! Still wow. paying back my loans. Kids can't do that today. Mm -hmm. It was you know, I, I, it's it's very difficult. Mm -hmm. So I had, although school was expensive and I worked continually. I had okay, a job. I was going to ask you, what were your job jobs? Uh, well, my job jobs during Yale was were um, I I I painted painted people's homes. Mm -hmm. I painted on weekends. Mm -hmm. I would paint houses for somebody. I worked at a floral shop, a delivery uh, delivery of florists, uh, uh, just cleaning up, watering plants, all this sort of stuff. Uh, no, no, I, I did a waiter at a local cabaret. I was a waiter. Uh, you know, and, uh, so, um, you know, I did all those, those, mm -hmm. those grunt jobs mm -hmm. and in summer times tried to, tried to go and make money at summer stock or things like that. And occasionally, uh, you know, other things if they, if summer stock didn't pay enough, mm -hmm. but again, trying to, uh, trying to just stay ahead of it. I had, my parents didn't have a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I had to know that. I was lending something towards this game. I wasn't going to write on it. I was, yes, I was getting some scholarships, some grants, some loans, but I also, I knew I couldn't just, oh, this is fun. Graduate school. Oh boy. You know, I knew I had to contribute something that was just the, uns well, I think it was a spoken rule. It was not an unspoken <laughs> rule. It was, a, it was a definitely a spoken rule. Yeah. We're going to work. <laughs> We're going to work on weekends and work when you can, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, so you got out of Yale. I got out of Yale and was fortunate. What if this is a, this is like my life story? Well, it is because it's fascinating because people out there don't know this about like, how does somebody get from Chicago parochial yeah. school to. Well, 
Yeah, all right. So, uh, I, I, again, good, there was good fortune. I was in the right, some right places at one time. There was something in, back in those days, I don't even know if it exists anymore, called mm -hmm. the Theater Communications oh. Group, TCG, oh. the Theater Communications Group. And what they would do is mm -hmm. they would do individual auditions all over the United States mm -hmm. at schools. They'd go to mm -hmm. schools and say, mm -hmm. hey, do some auditions for us, you graduating seniors or graduate students, as I was in this case. And you do auditions for this theater communications group. And what this was, this was a group that was hired by regional theaters all over the United States who said, we don't know who's out there. We need somebody as a facilitator to find talent for us, theaters all over the United States. So what right. they did was I got a place with several of my, um, several of my classmates at Yale. Did anybody else at Yale with you break through? Uh, well, yes, yes, and yes, and no, they became working actors all okay. their lives. Mm -hmm. That counts. Never had their own television series, but you can see them guesting on series and working mm -hmm. constantly in the theater and, and all over the place. Mm -hmm. So they're working actors. A few went into um, educational theater mm -hmm. and became incredible educators all their lives te teaching young talent. You know, so uh, so there were a lot of successes. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mine is different simply because it was more visible, more highly visible. Why? Because of family ties and things like that. Mm -hmm. But some people have made their entire living in theater. Wow. So that, that, is. that itself. Yeah. In the mm -hmm. arts mm -hmm. um, and t terribly, terribly talented people. It's mm -hmm. just it's so uncertain and, and, and unfair and you well, know, I, I stumbled into family ties. Anyway, um, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, the Theater Communications Group mm -hmm. had auditions, and then they, they picked several people from different different schools, and they have then they would pick a central location, in this case, Chicago, my hometown, and they said, uh, you and a couple other people from Yale are going to come to Chicago, and what they do is they bring casting directors artistic directors from theaters theaters not hollywood right 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 all over the united states the dallas theater theater center and uh, uh the uh, the the um um uh, gordon davidson and the uh you know mm -hmm. uh, in in los angeles and mm -hmm. uh, the center theater group with mark mm -hmm. taper forum mm -hmm. uh, the philadelphia this the that the baltimore center stage mm -hmm. uh oslo theater in florida they're all coming on one weekend in chicago mm -hmm. to see the people we've picked well to uh, to audition for them mm -hmm. so you're not guaranteed a job but you have an entire audience of theater wow. uh directors, uh, casting people uh, who say, who are there to watch your work and maybe, if you're lucky, offer you a job. So after a weekend there, I got a couple nibbles from people who said, we'd like to interview you, we'd like to talk to you after your auditions because mornings are all auditions and afternoons are people who are invited to talk to these people in rooms. And it's like, oh, it's okay, how many did I get? How many wanted to see me? So I went to, I have one of mine happened to be uh, the Actors Theater of Louisville in Louisville, mm -hmm. Kentucky, which was a very, very good theater, had a very good uh, reputation, uh, particularly mm -hmm. for new plays and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was run by a man named John Jory, J-O-R-Y, who was the son of a famous Hollywood actor named Victor Jory. Mm -hmm. And uh, Victor was, um, did a ton of things. If you look him up, you know, do, do the, do the, do the search engine thing mm -hmm. and look for Victor mm -hmm. Jory. And he was a, a, a craggy faced man who uh, was sometimes the lead, but always, you know, the bad guy. He was the, he was mm -hmm. the, he was the carpet bagger in gone with the wind. Gone. Wow. With the wind. Anyway, Victor, wow. Victor, uh, he said, so anyway, Victor was as close as I came to Hollywood in those days. And his son promptly offered me a role. He said, "I'm my father is doing a long day's journey in tonight at the Actors Theater of Louisville next fall. Uh, I want you to. I would like to offer you the role of Edmund, one of his sons, in a long day's journey in tonight." 
and um, and then offer you a season. That is to say, I'm basically saying, come and do seven plays in one year, be a part of this company, and don't have to worry about auditioning for another year. You're going to do seven plays in one year, and uh, you're going to be a part of my acting company. And I went, I'll take it. You know, there are a couple other places that, that had expressed interest in, in me, and this seemed like the best offer, the interesting roles he was offering me. Uh, and so I went to live in Louisville, Kentucky for three and had years. It how did that work as far as room and board, getting paid, all of that? How did that I work? I was paid a total of $175 a week, mm -hmm. uh, but it was steady work. It right. was every week. Right. And the, and, and now that's, if you do the, do the math, that's like uh, $700 a month or something. Yeah. No. 125 Almost. No, no, 175. Oh, 175. Okay. 175. So, 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 yeah. So, $700 yeah. a month. Yeah. I yeah. paid for my, for my apartment in Louisville, Kentucky. I paid $70 a month. <laughs> okay. So, I was like, I'm rich. <laughs> you know, I am making a $175 a week. And, but, but, I'm, I'm paying $175 a month for an apartment. This is great. Plus, you're probably so busy that you don't have time to spend well, money no, other no, than no, to never, eat. Never, right? never, never. Just socked yeah. it all away. I was yeah. uh, I was doing seven plays a year. I was re I rehearsal was every day at noon and till five o'clock. And then curtain was at uh, and then a half hour call was at seven thirty. Curtain at eight. I was always rehearsing one play while doing another one at night. It was the best sort of thing an actor could do. Now, a lot of people wanted to go to New York, wanted to go to Hollywood and all this sort of thing. And I went, I want to do, I wanted to do it the old fashioned British way. I wanted to go to the provinces and learn my craft. Um, wow. Because I thought if I go to New York, um, mm -hmm. Al Pacino will be the star and I'll be the seventh spear carrier to the left. <laughs> and I thought if I go to I'm being offered great roles in these smaller companies. And that's, right. I need to, um, I need to cut my teeth on these things. Yes, make mistakes, but learn, learn out there. I'm not going to be offered interesting big roles. I mean, I could in New York, but I'll be I'll be waiting tables and driving a cab. Hear somebody say, "Be an actor for nine months out of the year." Fantastic. And at 175 bucks a week, <laughs> come on, who from working class Chicago could uh, could refuse that sort of thing? So that was the beginning and. I think the second year I was there, he gave me maybe a two two hundred dollars a week. And the third year I was there, I made two twenty five a week. And uh, and then I moved. I left there after three years because I was I was loving it, and I thought I love Louisville, but this is I was becoming a sort of big fish in a small pond. Mm. Uh, and uh, I thought if I don't leave Louisville now, I'll never leave it because it's comfortable and wonderful, and I love the people here and. I, I could stay forever. Mm -hmm. And I saw people who had stayed forever and made great lives for themselves. Mm -hmm. But I just thought, I don't know, I wanted to, I, I just had to keep challenging myself. Mm -hmm. So the next place I went was the, uh, uh, the Guthrie Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota, which had been founded by the British Sir Tyrone Guthrie, mm -hmm. where they did a lot of, a lot of sort of British influence, a lot of, it took me a lot more into the classics. And it was an incredible uh, incredible uh, theater experience, and I got paid. I went from two twenty-five to two fifty a week at the wow. Gospel. Wow, I was rocking it. <laughs> at any rate, after after a number of years of that sort of thing, I went uh, I went back to the Yale Repertory Theater, uh, where they were doing more edgy experimental stuff, and um, I got a little tired of the. I I loved the Shakespeare and the classics at the Guthrie, but it was a lot of expensive costumes, very traditional, kindly ladies and courtly gentlemen stuff. And mm. I thought, I want something edgier. I want something edgier. And uh, so I went back to Yale where they're doing more experiments, experimental stuff, stayed at the Yale Repertory Theater, which was the professional act, right. act part of the Yale uh, Drama School. And I forget how much money I made there. But um, uh, it was there for a couple of years and then I started freelancing going out to a few other places and finally from New Haven I was back in New Haven at the Yale Repertory Theater finally began 
dipping a toe into New York theater. And finally, I uh, was doing some some interesting and some Yale was doing some fascinating work. And it was only 75 miles from New York. And one day, a couple agents saw my work and said, we think you'd be we'd be right for you. We'd we'd like to represent you in New York. We think we can get you work. And uh, uh, I finally took the brave step of going to New York and uh, getting a three hundred dollar a week uh, a month apartment in Brooklyn Heights, New York. Wow. Again, it was a studio apartment. I didn't need much. Mm -hmm. I was one subway stop away from Manhattan, so it was a little mm -hmm. cheaper. And um, but. Uh, I started working in New York and got good reviews and started seeing good people and became a part again, lucky me, a part of that New York, New York theater is like a big repertory company. You know, it's mm -hmm. a big company of the actors who work all the time, Broadway mm -hmm. and off Broadway. Mm -hmm. There's a core of people who the critics and the theater people get to know. And I became a part of that working group in New York. What and time frame is this, Michael? This was a late seventies mm -hmm. family, family ties started in, in 1982. Mm -hmm. And I was in New York from approximately 1979 to 1982. So three years. And I did Broadway. I did off Broadway. I did uh, Lincoln center, you know, the good prominent Broadway and off Broadway theaters. You won and a few awards there too. I was fortunate enough to, uh, yes. An OB award I mean, and yeah. yeah. And that um, I just and uh, was nominated for some other things. Didn't mm -hmm. you know Tony? You know uh, the Drama Circle Awards and stuff like this. Uh, uh, again, taking I wanted to. I'll give you an idea of what I wanted to do. I wanted to take. To me, the work was always interesting, more interesting than the acclaim. So it's ironic mm -hmm. I wound up in in Hollywood, becoming to some people a household name. Um, because I always had this feeling that the actor was the greatest compliment you could give an actor when he walked out the stage door was not to recognize him. Mm -hmm. No, that wasn't that guy who played that character. Seriously, he's so different. I don't recognize him. Wow. You know, it's submerging yourself into a character and people go, no, that's, you know, so to be recognizable was always like not the point of it. You know, you wanted to become someone else totally, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, they'd pass you on the street and didn't know who the hell you were. That to me was exciting acting, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the whole point. Uh, but anyway, um, I was offered my first Broadway show at the same time as I was offered an off-Broadway show. And the Broadway show wound up running for maybe six or eight months or something like this. And it was a very popular show. Uh, the off-Broadway show was going to be for a total of three weeks, three weeks of rehearsal, three weeks of performance. It was a definite time slot thing. Mm -hmm. And I got the role, I got the offer at the same time. And I said to my agent, oh, I want to do the off-Broadway show. And I, my agent went, what are you talking about? This is Broadway. This is Broadway. Broadway's come calling, Mr. Gross. And I said, but there's this director, a man named Joseph Chaikin who was an idol to me, who had run something in the 60s called the Open Theater, which did some oh, sure. cutting edge work mm -hmm. in New York. He worked with a brilliant playwright named John, John Claude Van Itali, who and they were doing weird counterculture stuff. And mm -hmm. he had this whole troupe of people that I thought, this is probably the greatest theatrical director in the world. He was wow. doing a production of Endgame by Samuel Beckett mm -hmm. that tapped me for one of the four roles in Endgame. And um, and I said, I got to work with him. But he said, no, this is Broadway. And I said, no, but this is Joseph Chaikin of the Open Theater. And I know it's only three weeks, but I want to do it. And the Broadway people kept coming back. They wanted me, which was wonderful for this interesting role. Uh, uh, and um, and kept offering more money. They said, he's, he wants more money. He said, no, he actually wants to work with this other director. So they find, I finally got to do both. Long story short, I had the greatest Broadway contract on record. They finally realized that the, I did really want to do this. They let me rehearse the play. I opened it. I was there for th the day I opened that play uh, on Broadway. I went into rehearsal for three weeks 
for the next one off Broadway with Mr. Chaikin and um, and and was allowed to leave the Broadway show after three weeks and they with an offer to come back and do it to resume my role there after this and close I was like I've been there done that I mean, I, I never, so I never went back to that show. What was the Broadway play? The Broadway, sh the Broadway play was the, um, was a kind of a newsmaker because mm. it was entitled, it was a play by a man named Martin Sherman entitled mm -hmm. Bent. I and remember it, Bent. Bent was about homosexuals in Nazi Germany and the persecution of homosexuals in Nazi Germany. Richard Gere played. Of they course. went. Richard Gere played played the main character. Mm -hmm. They particularly they wanted a, a strong heterosexual presence because they knew they were going to get a lot of men coming to this, gay men coming to this. Mm -hmm. They wanted a heterosexual audience. They cast Richard Gere, a wonderful actor named David Duke, as the two leads. Richard Gere and David Duke, who I had admired for years, I knew mm -hmm. David well, and I was cast in a scene that it, it two scenes in the play of a drag queen and so uh so I mean, how could you not think that was edgy when you were weighing those you know, I say, well i did but i did but the other one was joe joe chaikin mm -hmm. and yes i was offered so i mean the story was my so you 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 call your your working class parents in chicago and you say <laughs> broadway really you say yeah i have my own scene you do what i have a song Seriously, I am singing this song by myself, being lowered from, lowered from uh, on a tra trapeze, and they're going, "Whoa, Michael, this is incredible!" Well, the, but I am dressed as a female. <laughs> I'm in, I'm in a garter belt and panties and fishnet hose with a red wig, and Dad is like, "How do I tell the guys at the factory about this?" You know. <laughs> My son, the drag queen, it's my Broadway oh. debut was was this Nazi. Um, um, wow, he was a Nazi informant. He was a wow. bad guy. He ran he ran the club that uh, Richard he, he was a friend of Richard Gears and mm -hmm. uh, and his partner and ran this club, but turned them into the not turned them into the Nazis. He was a son of a bitch, very edgy character. Um, and fascinating and uh but just again that transformational thing you love i mean when i walked that up was very ballsy of you michael to no, consider it, turning that down what a role and what an opportunity but well, you I want guess, that other thing so much but, but, the I, other, I, I, but all right the but other, i have a question yeah, for you go ahead do you think it's possible and i want to hear what you have to say do you think it's possible that because you were willing to walk away from it, you got both. Well, no. No. So, <laughs> saying, <laughs> no, I did. No, I say I was about to say no is a very important word in this business. Mm -hmm. And sometimes people can want you more where they say, who the who the F is he to say no to me? This is mm -hmm. Broadway calling. Mm -hmm. How do people do that? Now, all right, I'll, I'll just tell you a little secret. This was one of the uh when I finally went to New York. Mm -hmm. Years later, I because I was only because I was making all that money in regional theaters, and but spending very little on housing. I came with a I came to New York with uh, cash, mm -hmm. with thousands of dollars worth of cash, mm -hmm. maybe maybe six or seven seven thousand dollars worth of money that I had. Like a right. mon like a miser, like Moliere's the miser <laughs> had kept because I was like, I did I I went to New York and I said, I'm going to New York and I'm not gonna wait tables and I'm not going to drive cabs and I'm gonna say no to roles that I think are beneath me. Wow. Because I had given myself the cushion, the financial cushion, I had a three hundred dollar uh a month apartment mm -hmm. and I've got money in the bank. So when somebody offers me something, I'm going to say, I'm just not interested. I say, who the F is this new guy in town that he's turning us down, you know, but so that, that to me, the money gives you that option. So I had mm -hmm. saved my money like a good responsible 
lower middle class, working class Chicago kid would mm -hmm. and said, I'm going to be practical about hitting New York. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come with money so I don't have to take any job that's offered me. So I was willing to say no to Broadway because of this other now, because this other role was also a great role. Mm -hmm. a, a, a Samuel Beckett character of there's Ham and Clove, these two, these two great mm -hmm. characters in a in a brilliant play called Endgame. And I thought, that yeah, this is new. It's Broadway, it's a drag queen, but that's only one scene. This is only this is this whole play this one directed by this marvelous director so I, I have no choice i'm looking for a learning experience more than i'm looking for uh prestige you know i'm looking where can, who can i learn the most from i love that so so that's well, but those choices those choices were always even even i must say even i i look back on it now and I think I made some stupid choices after Family Ties. Those were the, there were some days when everybody made television movies, a mm -hmm. lot of television movies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was, a, I was a, at a point where, I mean, I, I don't like to talk about money, but I could make a fair amount of money mm -hmm. doing a television movie. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there would be this, the NBC Sunday night movie, <laughs> the movie of the, you know, the Monday right. night movie, the this, that, mm -hmm. that every there were three networks and everyone made their you know or they mm -hmm. do miniseries and i remember turning down i turned for example a wonderful director a guy i'd worked with three times came to me mm -hmm. and said um they were doing the they were doing a movie about the challenger accident you know where the ship mm -hmm. went up and it blew up mm -hmm. and wanted to know did i want to play was it like Dick Scobie or something? The 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 captain of the Challenger who was mm -hmm. going to get blown up at the end, mm -hmm. and a lot of money. And I went, well, that's a whole stupid premise. I mean, it's, it's a movie about people who are waiting for the the last five minutes to see us all blown up. I mean, come, <laughs> you know, they were going to make the movie. They, and I said, I love you as a director, but this is a stupid idea. They're I mean, everybody, people are not going to tune in until the last 10 minutes because the most important part is to see, <laughs> see us all blown up. And, and you're going to fill in a lot of little domestic thing, kissing their wives. Oh, we have wonderful children, but we all know what's happening. They're all going to die. <laughs> and you're going to see the teacher, you know, teaching mm. her kids science, who's going to, she's going to get blown up. And I said, I really don't want to do this movie. So I would, those are the days where I was mm. turning down crazy lucrative things because I thought I'm not going to learn anything from this. And it's mm. a stupid idea, you know? Um, <laughs> it's kind of hysterical, but I get it. You know, I now, get I wish, now I wish I was offered those things. I was like, oh, <laughs> whoa, the money I turned down. <laughs> oh boy. Somebody asked about the first uh, experience. Just tell me what you want. Your first film? Oh, yeah, with Ali McGraw. He wants to know about that. Will Harris asked about that. Well, I will say this was uh, that. Yeah, that was the first time I did a it was I had two scenes uh, and I'll never Sydney Lumet. That was another thing. Sydney. Oh. Lumet was, I mean, you know, 12 Angry Men, uh, mm. among, among other things. I mean, you know, you name it. Sydney Lumet was the director. It's like, wow, I'm being offered a role by Sydney Lumet. The role was this tiny, you know, and it two scenes, uh, both with Ali McGraw. And I remember wow. I, went, I remember I did see him and. Uh, well, had she it, already it, done Love Story at this point? Was she already a huge yes, star? That's why she was doing this. She had already done Love Story. Okay. So Ali was a big. Huge. And yeah. I was a person who sat next to her at a dinner table, engaged her in conversation in a couple of scenes. That was my role was to. You know, he was a great, very guy full of with lots of jewelry, very full of himself. <laughs> and I remember the, uh, mm -hmm. the, um, and she was lovely. You know, she was lovely. She, by the way, lives where I'm calling you from in Santa Fe, New Mexico now. Oh, nice. I, I, I have occasionally run into her and whether she remembers or not, she's kind enough to say, oh yes, of course I remember that. Work <laughs> not a chance in the world. You know, I was, you know, it was my, anyway, I was a nobody anyway. Uh, so, uh, but you make what, a good impression. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful working with, with, 
with uh, with Allie and Sidney Lumet, and I'll never mm -hmm. forget. I went to uh, I went to see it. No, I was not a I was not a character upon whom this plot hinged. <laughs> you know, you did. I was not important to the storyline. I remember Sydney mm -hmm. saying before I say, he says, oh, I just want to prepare you. He said, I had to do a little snip, snip, snip on your role. You know, <laughs> a little cutting. And I went like, uh, the role, was... I didn't say anything, but I went, oh, huh. <laughs> I myself, oh that, that role wasn't that big to begin with. Whoa. <laughs> so, I mean, I wound up with, I think a 40 second scene with Ali McGraw, but it was fun. It was, you know, you, you cut your teeth on these things mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, you look and Alan King was in that. And oh, wow. So, you know, you got to, you know, you got to experience just being what's being on a set is like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, actually, the first film I did, oh my God, I was still at the Actors Theater of Louisville. And this is a film that can still be found on, uh, and boy, was I lucky. Again, very fortunate. Still be found on YouTube. Okay. It, it was entitled A Girl Named Sooner. Now, let me tell you. I'm writing it down. Who, let me tell you who the actors were in this thing. Okay. There was Richard Crenna. Wow. I loved him. Horace Leachman, with whom I had Aww. a pre Horace Leachman. Um, uh, Anne Francis. Don wow. Murray, known oh. for Bus Stop, you know, with mm -hmm. Marilyn and Don Murray. Um, uh, Lee Remick. Excuse me. So there's. Um, uh, uh, Richard Crenna and Lee Remick were playing uh, husband and wife. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I had all my roles with Cloris, who was an absolute nut and wonderful actress. Cloris was in the living room. She's oh, she was something. Yeah, uh, I, um, Don Francis, Anne Murray, great, great people. Anyway, that was my first film for TV. And I was still at the Actors Theater of Louisville and uh -huh. they were filming this in Southern Indiana, not far from Louisville and tapped me for it. And so I played a, a bootlegger to a, a, to a, somebody who had a still who was Cloris Leachman, an old, old woman out in a cabin. Play, Cloris was just wonderful. She was again, one of those transformative actresses. Mm -hmm. She was, uh, she was a beauty queen when mm -hmm. she was at Northwestern mm -hmm. University and mm -hmm. and Miss Chicago once upon mm -hmm. a time. And she was one of those people who, again, loved to transform herself. I remember she played this woman called Old Ma'am, and she had these sagging breasts, two, two bags of rice in a wow. brassiere. And she, she was bent to be <laughs> watch, go find a girl. I, I wrote it down. Sooner. Wow. With Horace yeah. Leachman. It's a very dear family, so directed by Delbert man who among other things had been the director of the original director of marty with uh ernest uh with uh, uh ernest borgnine no no no, yeah. no yes yes well, it may have been with rod, rod steiger was the first marty he may have done he may have anyway uh rod steiger was the first i saw marty. one of them but i don't remember and there was ernest borgnine who did marty on on the big screen mm -hmm. uh, rod steiger did marty as a television show on like oh, Playhouse wow. 90 or something. Wow. Like that. He was the first, anyway. Uh, but uh, Delbert Mann was an old style director who had done a shitload of that stuff with great people. So, I mean, I worked, I, New York were great days. I worked with, I worked with extraordinary people in New York in those days. Did uh, you study, Michael? Did you continue to study or because you had done all this repertory theater, was that your school? Oddly enough, that was my school. And mm -hmm. I, I, I did not continue studying because I was always working. I right. had no time for acting classes. Mm -hmm. The acting classes were in the work. Right. So I did very, very little of that because work was coming fast mm -hmm. and furiously. Uh, thank God. Thank God. Fantastic. Um, how, how did, how did you, how did what became your defining role. How did Family Ties come to you? Family Ties came, came it was, I was on my third year in New York and it came, mm -hmm. came through the, uh, I was doing an off-Broadway play at the time and mm -hmm. uh, somebody came to me or my agent came to me and said, there's this role for this 60s father with the family. And you know, you were very much part of the, the 60s and all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, would you be interested in auditioning for this thing? I had auditioned for uh, two other, a couple of, I wasn't really interested in that much television. I was loving my mm -hmm. work in the theater. Mm -hmm. And he said, this would, 
this is an NBC show. It's going to be filmed out in California. And I was like, mm-hmm. I just don't know. Is am I being a whore? You know, seriously, <laughs> you know, <laughs> theaters where you know the real. Um, so I, mm-hmm. I wasn't sure. Mm-hmm. I had done some great television before. I had guest spots on mm-hmm. New York's uh, New York based series, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, and and uh, and had done one other interesting pilot, which was not picked up. Something called the Neighborhood, which took place in Brooklyn, which a bunch of bunch of people, some fine young actors uh-huh. in this thing. It was just never picked up by NBC, but it was about you know Brooklyn people just hanging out, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, shot on location in New York. Uh, that didn't get picked, up. and the only other one I had auditioned for was Saint Elsewhere, which I thought was wow. brilliantly written. Wow! Uh, uh, and this Saint Elsewhere. Mm-hmm. And ironically, the guy who got the role, who for which uh, that was that the same year, mm-hmm. Family Ties. I auditioned mm-hmm. for two, Saint Elsewhere and Family Ties. Mm-hmm. The the role up for which I was up for in Saint Elsewhere was was filled by David Burney. Oh, actor David Burney. Wow, playing the husband of his real life Meredith Baxter Burney. Wow, Family Ties. So David was going to work every day on Saint Elsewhere. The role that I had wanted on St. Elsewhere. Uh, and, uh, and I wound up playing uh, opposite his real life. Now she's Meredith Baxter. She's dropped the, the name Bernie. Um, and uh, so anyway, ironic. That's it. That, I had no audition for much because I wasn't interested. I was, I was a theater baby. I felt I would probably end my life that way, doing the work I was doing, maybe the, uh, the odd film, New York based. Um, you know, I auditioned for good people in those days. And it wasn't always getting the roles in the major motion pictures, but I thought it was only a matter of time. I auditioned for John Carpenter and, you know, just wonderful, wonderful. I saw good people. I auditioned for Woody Allen. You know, he was looking for types. You know, he wasn't, you didn't even, you didn't have to read for Woody. You just had to right. sit, sit in a room with talk with him and he wanted to get your fee, feeling for you. You know, what? Uh, you know, what kind of a person are you? What do you look like? What do you, what do you bring in with you just talking to him? And he, he would cast from that. He was told by his, look, they're all good actors. Just pick, pick somebody who think is good with your material. You know, mm-hmm. so, I mean, I, I was auditioning with good, good people, wonderful people and getting great, getting great jobs. I was very thankful in those young days to be working with uh, really fine people, old timers like Sylvia Sidney, who had been in, in uh yeah, i worked with rod steiger i worked with wow Jason robards i worked with wow just extraordinary people in a lot of uh mini series and stuff like that in the days when they were doing mini series mm-hmm. uh, worked with uh, betty davis uh, wow <laughs> what was that like something called little gloria happy at last was about gloria um uh god gloria uh, Little Gloria, Gloria Vanderbilt, Vanderbilt. Oh, about the Vanderbilt family. Uh, mm-hmm. So I mean, it was an incredible cast with Angela Lansbury and, wow. and uh, Chris Christopher Plummer and uh, and uh, you know. So I got to meet uh, you know, dear God, I, I, I was in a scene with uh, 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 with Betty Davis and Angela Lansbury. I mean, holy crap. So oh I met, God. I was, as a young actor in my thirties, I was f- very fortunate to meet some of the old timers before they were gone and work with mm-hmm. them. Um, I don't think it was ever better for me in some ways. Well, you, you know, starstruck, w- w- I mean, meeting Betty Day, De- working with them. Well, I mean, I was star, I was starstruck. I was starstruck. I remember, I remember an evening once in Toronto where there was, um, um, there was, um, Jason Robards and an old character actor named Nehemiah Persoff and a guy named Ed Bins and some people who had been like two of them had been in 12 Angry Men. I mean, you know, and been in great films and they'd worked, they just working actors for their entire lives and uh, just listening to them tell stories of the old days of, of their films they had done with other people and, 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 and Jason Robards had been a big drinker in his, in his day and, you know, getting drunk between matinee and evening performances on Broadway and just coming back and trying to, 
trying to get through a performance half drunk and just I mean, oh, these stories and um, you know the old days and uh, classic Hollywood and Broadway stuff these were people so I was a bit star I was just I was just I was like 30 and sitting there listening to them tell stories to each other wow you know and so that was that was exciting to me how was your life changing my I mean obviously you weren't in a $300 apartment in Brooklyn Heights anymore um well, no I was still in that apartment <laughs> well, no I was were and, you really oh well, I love well, it no and those this was before this is all before family ties oh okay okay this was when I was in New York at the $300 apartment and working with these incredible mm. people. yeah and I uh yeah yeah I I learning from my elders uh and that's uh, phenomenal it was phenomenal i th i counted some of the best years of my of my acting life because and this filming was happening in new york yeah yeah or being cast out of new york mm -hmm. they still do it's like you know then that's what the real actors are blah 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 <laughs> yeah. it's still that that thing you know yes. yeah if you can get a hollywood name that's great but new york is where these gritty working you know mm. The Al Pacinos and the, you know, this and that, you know, the, the mm -hmm. these, the, you know, these, these gritty people. That, that's still a little how casting directors feel. I get it. You know, these, these are people willing to make nothing just for their art. You know, they're not interested right. in the bright lights and the, you know, that sort of thing. So right. I, I, I uh, when I finally came to uh, Family Ties, again, being the practical person I was, I was there for the first year. I was assumed it would never last beyond the first 12 episodes. So I took a sublet from somebody and uh, and made, of course, more money than I ever made in my life. Very inexpensive, not by... Not by did, did you know that it was great material, no. brilliantly cast? You didn't know this? No, I didn't because I was used to doing Samuel Beckett, another, you know... Yeah. It was like, okay, it's a sitcom, it's fun, it's the, the jokes are, you know, okay, I get it. Hippie parents, conservative children, easy jokes that way. And so I wasn't mm -hmm. appreciating it. And it really, in that first year, hadn't come to mm. really find itself as mm -hmm. well as it, it eventually would. Mm -hmm. They were searching for the, they were searching for the right formula. They thought they had a formula. And they, but they, they were, they were in the process of looking for it. And fortunately, NBC was patient enough for them to say, yeah, keep looking, keep looking. We'll keep you on. Mm -hmm. You're not making great numbers. You're maybe 20th or 24th. Oh, wow. No, we're still not bad. Which is still okay. Yeah. Yeah. Still okay. But not but, like what you became. But not like what we became, but they were patient to let us find ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the difference for me was when I was suddenly making thousands of dollars a week as opposed to hundreds of dollars a week mm -hmm. was um i remember i remember i still assumed okay i'm going to bank this money put it away i never i didn't i didn't get a car i took i would i would ride my bicycle to paramount studios wow uh you know i was still a new yorker or take on rainy days i would take the bus from West, wow. Hollywood, West Hollywood to Paramount Studios, uh -huh. and uh, they say, "How'd you get here?" A bus. It's like you have a, you have a sitcom. Buy a car. It's like I don't need a car. <laughs> anyway. So um, I thought it was going to fail, and I th <laughs> saw, sock away the money. Then I have a lot more money to go back to New York and say no with. <laughs> <laughs> and so, so I remember thinking. I remember in those days I was still buying um, uh, frozen orange juice, mm -hmm. and I thought. You know, and it's, wow. you know, you buy frozen orange juice, put the frozen orange juice in the pitcher mm -hmm. and then add three cups, three cans of water. And I thought, I'm making enough money now. I'm only going to add two cans of water. <laughs> you know, I'm going to, I'm going to, this is, that to me was living the high life. It's like, I'm not going to dilute my orange juice. You know that Seriously. That was wow. I thought you were going to say that you added five cans of water to make it go long. Oh, hard. no, no. That's I thought, you know, now I'm really going to splurge. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to dilute that orange juice as much. See, that to me was the high life, right? Wow. Wow. Me, I would rent a car on weekends. That was my car experience. I knew how to drive. Right. You know, I just thought, why, you know, why invest in all that? You know, and I liked the idea of renting a car on weekend. I was like, okay, I'll take that convertible Mustang or I'll take that 
I'll take that fancy car there. Uh, I don't like the color. I'll change, you know, and I had no responsibilities. I mm. love that because, you know, I'd lived in apartments all my life. I didn't want responsibility. I lived a kind of, I just want the work and then I'll, okay, if I need to pay, you know, pay a little extra. How, what time is it? How long are we? So oh, yeah, we're, 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 well, well, it lasts as long as we want it to. Oh. We can, we can start moving forward. So, so when did your life change? When did you let your life change? When did it change for you? The biggest change in my life was by far two, two, two years into family ties. I got married. And How did you meet Elsa? <sighs> Elsa, my wife was the casting person at Paramount Studios for family oh. ties. Oh my gosh. She was the person who did my deal. That is to say, she is the person with whom my agent in New York fought on the phone. <laughs> she was saying, we're not going to give this, sh this shithead anything. He's an unknown. Come on, he's in New York and he's never done anything. He's not worth it. You know, so she was like lowballing it. I say, wow. if you know what you knew now, you could have done a lot better for me, right? You know, because now we're married. <laughs> we could lowball the whole thing. And my... I, my agent was like, who are you dealing with? He says, oh, I'm dealing with this woman, Elza. She's at Paramount. She's doing the deal. She's tough. I said, Elza, geez, that's very Germanic. And I started calling her the bitch of Buchenwald. Oh my God. You know, to my agent, I was like, Elza, the, Bu the bitch of Buchenwald. And wow. then I met, after I got cast, I came out here, started doing the show and met her. And I thought she was I don't know, Archie comic books. There was this severe teacher named Mrs. Grundy who had a, you know, a bun on the back of her head. And she was like, and I thought she was going to look horrible and you know, tough and mean. And she was this attractive, gorgeous, gorgeous, she's gorgeous, gorgeous young woman. And I was like, she was friendly and she came out from behind her desk and shook my hand. Hi, so nice to meet you. So glad you're here. Glad we could work this out and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, yeah, good for you. I'm living in my car. You know. <laughs> Anyway, oh, she, you didn't have a car, no, 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 no. but uh, so, uh, uh, but she was very helpful when it came to renegotiation. So long story short, she was a single mother of two teenage children. Mm -hmm. I had never been married two years after we met, we mar I married her, became father of these children who are now in their fifties and I've wow. grandchildren of my own. And, uh, that was the big change in my life. It was not about, it was not about the business. Mm -hmm. It was about uh, this solitary uh, man uh, allying himself and, uh, and realizing that that's probably the reason I came out to do family ties was to you make know, your own family ties. Make my own family ties. Yeah. Okay. So because we've been talking a long time, I have a couple more questions and I'll let Okay, I have to. We can do. You. We can do part two. Some other. We, we can do a part two, but tremors. You just have to tell us how to tre because tremors. Tre I can't mm -hmm. believe seven. There are seven. Are seven, seven? We've done. We've done seven. The last one, tremor seven, island. What was that called? Shrieker Island mm -hmm. came out in uh, October of 2020. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, um, uh, actually did quite well in spite of COVID, you know, because it was, it was always released to video and on demand anyway. So it wasn't mm -hmm. like people had to go to theaters, mm -hmm. but uh, it did very well. And it's, wow. and all the tremors could be found on Netflix. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was just amazing. We've done seven because from a person who did not, not necessarily was uncomfortable with doing the same character all the time to return to this man seven times, um, was kind of unusual, but I will say the, the wonderful thing about it was the, the character is a comic masterpiece because he's mm -hmm. completely OCD, paranoid, mm -hmm. but it's a comic paranoia. He is so over the top <laughs> that he's ridiculous. He leads, leads a ridiculous life, um, a constrained life. And I consider him a comic character, mm -hmm. you know, because, uh, because he has no sense of humor. <laughs> he, you know, he's so comedy is about extremes in many mm. ways. People going so far, they can't find their way back. They've, they've lost all sense of proportion. And comedy <laughs> is like that, you know, mm -hmm. something has become so important. It's crazy and it's funny. And you see somebody. And so he was always, to me, a comic masterpiece because mm -hmm. of his paranoia, his obsessive compulsive disorder, mm. and a, a threat around every corner. And so, uh, 
I fortunately was on the set for that almost immediately after Family Ties. I don't know why these people called me in in the first place, but to this Did you know point, when you read it that, okay. Well, did, I thought it would be fun. I thought sci-fi, okay. Uh, but I did. I had no idea it was. You know, I I knew Kevin Bacon had been attached, and that was a mm -hmm. that was a draw. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I just I thought I thought to me I, I need to do something different because mm -hmm. I've been a Americans. Well, I Bill Cosby was America's favorite father. I was America's favorite Caucasian father. I was just going <laughs> to say white father. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. People say you're America's favorite father. I said no, no. America's favorite father is a black man. Well, I'm that changed a lot now, well, didn't it? <laughs> yeah, right, right. Well, I, I just haven't been caught yet, I guess. <laughs> At any rate, I, there's nothing that dark in my future, in my in my past. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, I was, uh, you know, I mean, probably as growing up in the '60s, I was, I guess, probably sexually prolific, but. But I always believe in sex the old-fashioned way, and meaning it was consensual. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, um, but anyway, um, uh, I, um, uh, I needed something different to do. And I thought the, the part of this sort of right-wing character and uh, this right-wing character in this, and I thought he, thought he was very serious. I had no idea how comic he was until we actually started getting on the set and realizing how crazy this guy was and crazy, <laughs> crazy funny. And right. it, de it developed in the filming of it. Um, uh, it was just wonderful. So it was a great opportunity. I'm forever thankful for uh, the, the writers and director of that piece who allowed me to, who took one of America's most famous fathers and let me do something entirely different, uh, which has always been the point of my acting. I. Uh, um, the spirit of your mother is strong within you. Yes, the spirit of my mother is strong, and uh, just wanting to do do something that was made me almost unrecognizable. You know, I love that. So, you know, there's so we are gonna. I, I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask you to come back because there's there, how I met your mother. There's 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 Boston legal. There's suits. There's the affair. You okay? So you played a doctor named Ezra, and did you take? Did you make that name because oh, of no. Elsa? No, that was the character name. I was no. like, oh, it's so close. No, that was <laughs> that was that was in the script. That was in the script. I I've never. I, I will. I will. If we get together another time, I'll tell you about a pilot that I just did. We don't have to talk about it now. I have no. Oh, you got you got to tell us about. It. Go ahead. We'll, no, no, we'll... no, I won't talk about it now. Okay. It's another time. But okay. I have done Family Ties was a hard act to follow. And Hell I, yeah. And I did not. I have loved the freelancing life. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times people are asked to recycle into yet another. Oh, you were so popular on that. Let's do another right, series right, right. with you. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it works out. Not always for the people on, you know, for very few of the people on um, uh, uh, Seinfeld, for example. But it certainly worked out for Julia Louis-Dreyfus. But, mm -hmm. but uh, 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 Seinfeld himself decided, I don't want to do anything more, uh, you know. Um, well, but he's doing the things that he loves. Comedians in cars, that. making with coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. He didn't. Yeah. He, yes, exactly. He didn't want to do another. Uh, he didn't right. want to repeat himself doing another series. Right. And I, when I got out of Family Ties, I felt a sense of freedom. Now, mm -hmm. I knew I was, I knew I was going to take a big cut in salary. Mm -hmm. I knew I'd be freelancing. I knew I'd be moving from job to job, but it felt, it felt like that part of that, that New York little repertory company I'd been in or actress theater mm -hmm. little, playing seven different roles in one year was always far more interesting to me than playing one character for seven years. Mm -hmm. So um, it was just this spring that I, I had auditioned for several pilots, some of them gritting my teeth as I was doing it saying this is a terrible piece of shit and it's not oh. as funny as family ties but i'm doing it because my agent said i had to and fortunately i never i, I didn't kick i think that attitude carried carried through in my performance <laughs> i never got <laughs> you have and that great role in grace and frankie you have a lot of things that have a lot of little things so yeah. it's like okay t to go from grace and frankie was done for re you know gay man because I had just completed yet another Tremors. So I played the survivalist with the guns. It's like somebody's offering you the role of a gay man. Oh yes, let's be a gay, let's be a gay caterer. You know? <laughs> I mean, yeah, what fun is that? I mean, the variety always excited me.
Mm -hmm. And there are times I think that I might end my days again in theater, playing the old, the grandfather and you can't take it with you or, wow. or you know, the, uh, the stage manager in our town. Mm -hmm. Roles I still haven't played yet and still kind of have a yen to play. Mm -hmm. um, just far more interesting than coming in. It's like somebody, you know, I'll get a, somebody to say, oh, do you want to play this lawyer on this thing? It's like, oh, shit, I've done so many lawyers. And he's just, you know, this is not interesting to me. I want a character with, with internal, with something going on as opposed to just, you know, or something wildly crazy funny as opposed to just being a guest. On, so I do less work because I feel like, oh, I did that character already or I did that one already. Uh, you know, unfortunately, and let's state it, it is a blessing that I have the choice to say no. Yes. I still find absolutely. myself all these years doing what I did in New York as a young actor saying, no, nah, I don't <laughs> do that. I still have that, that there's 6,000 bucks in the bank and I can yeah, say yeah, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. All right, so just quick about the pilot because you're doing it now, correct? The pilot? No, I'm not doing it now. It was a spec pilot. That is to say, I did the pilot. The pilot was like building a spec home. The home hasn't right. been sold. They mm -hmm. had enough money to build a spec home, right. but not to build a development, you know? Right. <laughs> we, built this, we built this one beautiful home and now they're mm -hmm. trying to sell it. But mm -hmm. I was interested enough in this pilot to say, wow, I really like this. I like these people. They they feel real. They don't feel mm -hmm. television stupid. <laughs> you know, they don't feel, they're not bad jokes just for the crude jokes, just to get people laughing. Mm. You know, it just, it seemed like a nice piece. So we'll talk more well, about that. Moment. I look forward to, to hearing about it and I hope it gets sold and we get to see it. Great. That would be a we'll good see, thing. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. So, Michael, I would love to have you back to talk about how you guys are handling COVID and what's going on and all, all right. these other projects we didn't talk about. But thank you so much. I pulled you out of your, your vacationing in New Mexico. Thank you. It's and, a pleasure to see you. And is that Picasso on the back wall? No, it's, it's um, uh, um, oh, my God. I just spaced on his name. This is terrible. Oh, it's out there. Alfred Van Loen one line drawings there. Oh, yes, 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 yes. 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 And they were, they, the originals were in the Museum of Modern Art, but these are lithographic copies that are signed oh, yeah. numbered. Yeah. Well, cross out the name and put Picasso yourself for more. Okay. All right. Take care. It's a real pleasure. I love you so much. Take and it was care. wonderful to see you. Please send my love to your beautiful bride. Thank and you. I hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Michael. Adios. Bye -bye. And thanks for watching everybody. Thank you, everybody. See you soon. Bye.